The marquee race in Arkansas, the one that seemed to offer Democrats a way forward. In the end, it wasn't close. The biggest prize of November, if it didn't go Donald Trump's way, it wasn't because Arkansas didn't get behind him. Still, there was no blue wave, not across the nation, not in Arkansas. What didn't work for Democrats and what kept down-ballot Republicans winning? And Republican dominance at the State House continues, tilting perhaps to the right, which means what for the party's Arkansas leader? Arkansas Week, coming up. Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR-FM 89. Hello again, everyone. Thanks very much for joining us thus far in Arkansas. No calls for recounts, though by Friday morning there were still some uncounted votes. Presidential race wasn't at stake, not here, not at all, but some legislative candidates were, still are, on edge. As clear as it's ever been, maybe clearer, Arkansas is a resolutely red state. And we'll spend the next half hour kicking around what happened, what didn't happen, and maybe why. Joining us from the left, Democratic strategist Michael Cook, and from the right, Bill Vickery, uh, Republican strategist and lobbyist. Jen says, always, thanks for coming in, Bill. Using legislative yeah. rules, having voted on the prevailing side, I assume, <laughs> we'll let you go first. What did we see? here in Arkansas on uh, on Tuesday night? It, it was um, it was a real show of force for uh, the Trump Republican Party in Arkansas. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the president uh, surged in the last two weeks and that really had a massive impact in Arkansas. I, I listen, I think Joyce Elliott ran a great campaign. Uh, what you saw was a just a turnout and, and a a deeper reddening of the congressional district that uh, most people did not see coming. Uh, you know, a lot of pollsters have some explaining to do uh, this week uh, because of the numbers that were thrown around. But but in reality, all the way down the ballot, um, it was it was an impressive showing in state senate races, in state house races. Uh, obviously, in a congressional race in central Arkansas, that was the marquee candidate race. Uh, it was a, a thicker reddening of the state more than ever before. Yeah, Michael? Uh, I have to agree with Bill. I mean, Arkansas is a, is a red state, and it got even redder uh, based on the election results uh, up and down the ballot. Uh, Trump, of course, won uh, by actually a little bit bigger margin than he did in 2016. Uh, Democrats, uh, unfortunately, lost two state Senate seats in South Arkansas, along with one House seat. Uh, didn't We thought we might make a little bit of inroads in Northwest Arkansas, not necessarily win, but close the margin on some of these legislative seats. That didn't happen. Uh, there are currently, as you alluded to earlier, there are two House seats in Pulaski County where uh, two Republican incumbents uh, are less than 100 votes shy of potentially losing. And the Pulaski County Election Commission is meeting today and I think also on Monday to try to count those last ballots. So right. there's a potential those two uh, incumbents may lose, which would be nice pickups for the Democrats. But uh, in terms of the ov overall big picture, while Joyce Elliott ran a fantastic race, there's not one thing uh, I would have recommend doing uh, differently in that campaign. She just can't break out of the Saline County, White County, Faulkner County, and the rest of uh, the second district, even though she won big in Pulaski. So ran a get ca great campaign, but unfortunately it wasn't close. So Democrats still have a long, long way to go before they can really start making any inroads. Yeah, well, uh, about uh, Senator Elliott's race and Congressman Hill's race. About, I don't know, seven, eight days before the election, a piece in, uh, in one of the national papers caught my eye. Well, I mean, it was widely reported. The very, uh, tends to be extremely accurate Iowa poll showed, Bill, Michael, showed uh, rural voters in particular really breaking uh, for Mr. Trump come and some of them coming back, independents coming back. Mm -hmm. And I was looking and I, at, at that and I thought, well, now this this stuff's contagious. This could, you know, 
this could affect other states, and apparently it did. Right. Well, again, as I, as I said, for the second district, the, the Democrat just has a, you know, when, when you're only getting 30% of the vote in a Saline County, which is a, a, a very large county, or uh, 20, 25% in the other counties, that's just, you can't make it up in Pulaski. So those those uh, those counties right. are the problem for the Democrats when you run in the second district. And that's why Joyce Elliott, even though ran a great race and to be commended, still ended up losing by a very solid 10 points or so. Yeah, a whisker under 80% in White County. Right. Bill Vickery. Yeah, listen, I don't think these were voters who made their mind up suddenly to vote for Donald Trump. These were voters, they were always Trump voters, but they became energized to go vote uh, inside the last two weeks of the campaign. And, and that's typically what happens. I mean, I, I think the left sees control of the narrative for a long period of time, talking about write-in ballots and, and mail-in stuff and early voting and all this, uh, the record number of early votes and all of that. But all that really did was motivate the Trump voter who was already gonna vote for Donald Trump, but it really motiv motivated that voter to, to show up at the polls. And, and what I think this does in Arkansas specifically, it means the 2022 election cycle, the Republican primary, any candidate running for anything is now going to run harder to the right. So ultimately, this is dragging public policy harder to the right because you, you can't deny the the really the show of strength here from from that from the Trump wing of the of the Republican Party in Arkansas specifically and the impact that can have. Uh, uh, Michael, what's going to be the impact on the Democratic Party? I mean, uh, with with uh, the successes that it did have, uh, is it going to go farther to the left, or was there a warning message in this? Uh, you know, in terms of Arkansas, Arkansas Democrats have always been in the center. Uh, the, the problem is the state has moved farther to the right. Uh, I think the difficulties Democrats are going to have going, hard, going forward is it becomes more difficult to recruit candidates up and down the ballot when you, when you have these kind of you know lopsided losses, it, it makes it harder to convince somebody to give up a year, year and a half of their life and career to run for office. Um, so you know Democrats have to do some regrouping. We need to do some restructuring uh, on on various levels, uh, really tinker with the message. But it, it's you can't make a mistake about it. In terms of Arkansas, it, it's going to be a, a, a red state for for quite a while. But Democrats, you can't give up. You have to keep fighting. I would ask both of you to reflect on this, if I am reading the numbers right, <clears throat> even where uh, turnout was elevated, uh, Democratic incumbents who won, and I'm talking about the Delta counties particularly, the Democratic who, uh, opponents who won did not run as well this time as they did two years ago. Mm -hmm. it's, it's Again, it's the reddening of Arkansas. I mean, uh, Democrats might pick up these two seats in Pulaski County. We don't, we don't know right. uh, we, until the election commission, but uh, with the exception of a seat in Fayetteville, which Democrat, the incumbent won, and uh, a, a Democratic incumbent in Conway, it, it's unfortunately the party has become just so focused in some smaller areas and is not competitive in these rural uh, areas. And, it, think, yeah, and, and Bill, Michael, this kind of goes to it. I, I, uh, it's not so pronounced in Arkansas as it is elsewhere, but you can still see it. And that this election showed what? Uh, appeared to this observer to be a growing urban-rural divide yeah. in, the, uh, in, the, in the country. Bill? 100%. You're exactly right. You just look at the state of Georgia, I think, probably is the, is the single best example of that. But you do see it here in Arkansas. Michael just alluded to it. I mean, a Ben Gilmore uh, wins a state Senate seat in an area of the state that you thought would have never elected a Republican, but did so overwhelmingly. Uh, the reddening of southeastern Arkansas down close to the, the Mississippi River uh, is intense. Uh, but then, as you point out, as we get a little closer into Pulaski County, in and around Little Rock, and then the urban area uh, where I am today, up in northwest Arkansas, you can see uh, where, the, where the population thickens and, dense and becomes more dense. That's where Democrats have an opportunity, not the classic old-style way. Now, let me tell you, Steve, something that's going to have a major impact on that, and I know you'll talk about it in coming weeks. We're going to redistrict everything in this upcoming legislative session in 2021, and Republicans will be in charge of that for the first time. So um, 
I, for my Democratic friends out there, it's only going to get worse um, <laughs> because it's it's going to be a, uh, it's going to be a map that's going to favor Republicans as it did for Democrats for 150 years. All right, let's take a pause here. We had a surge in across the country, and we had certainly had a surge in voting among young people. Arkansas PBS undertook a project uh, involving uh, basically you decide a bipartisan push, you know, for for electoral political participation. So one of our crews went out, and some of our interns went out, and we talked with some first-time voters just around the corner from our digs here. So let's roll that and let's see what they had to say. If you go out and vote, you're not only representing yourself, but you're representing a lot of people who might be afraid to speak up or vote or aren't thinking to do so, that have an agenda that might be really important that we're overlooking. I think the lives of my kids depends on this because uh, whatever choices we make right now will, will affect our future. As a Republican, I have always uh, thought that it was very important to be engaged, and so I've always worked with the Republican Party, and um, I think that it's uh, a great thing. The 2020 election, I think I care most about, you know, health care. Um, I think we've seen kind of what happens with COVID-19, it not being taken care of when you have all of these people that are now sick and how now have, you know, the chance to be considered um, you know, have pre-existing conditions. We really need to take, you know, a handle over health care and making sure everybody has access to that. I just feel like financially, businesses will be affected, and especially after COVID-19, it's a concern because I really care about small businesses, uh, and I would hate to see some of them be heavily affected by the outcome of this election or just by COVID in general and politics and the negativity surrounding it. Issues I think need to be addressed are um, immigration, and the police system. And then I think we need to do a better job with dealing with COVID. I think that's a really big issue as well. My biggest issue, I believe, is the economy. Um, I know that with COVID and everything shutting down, there were lots of jobs that were lost and our economy went downhill pretty quick. Um, and so I think that whoever has the best policies to get our economy back up to where it was and keep our economy as we need it to be uh, is probably the most important for me. You decide, and they do, and they did. Michael Cook, pocketbook versus pandemic, so it was styled, and it really didn't seem to matter that much here. Right, right. Yeah, the exciting thing is these these young people, of course, the, the cliche, the, the future of, of Arkansas politics. Um, you know, I've seen polling in northwest Arkansas where Republicans are, you know, dominant and, and control everything, but among voters who are, 35 and younger, those are those are swinging Democrat in terms of their beliefs, uh, their value systems, and what they believe in. Uh, the problem for Democrats is it just takes them a long time for them to become regular voters that the people who are 50 above and so yeah. on and so forth. So what we're seeing in Arkansas is what we're seeing, I think, across the country is uh, young people um, being more progressive than their elders. But the, the downside for Democrats, it just takes a long time for people to start re voting regularly. Yeah, uh, uh, Bill mentioned just a moment ago that agony that awaits Democrats with redistricting and sure. uh, with, with reapportionment, too. You know, occasionally you hear some talk about splitting up Pulaski County to <laughs> dilute it a, a, a bit. But I was talking with uh, a Republican friend who, who kind of shrugged his shoulders on, this is like Wednesday night or Thursday morning, <laughs> said, why bother? Right. Look at this. Yeah, for the second district, I mean, you know, from on the congressional level, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> if you're winning the second district by 10 points as it is and you're, 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 you're crushing Democrats in the outlying counties, why, why make a change? The, the one downside... You know, the, the upside for Republicans is that they could get, get to control the entire process from beginning to end. The downside is because they have to make so many people happy on the Republican side because, you know, they're going to be fighting each other. No, no, I don't want these two precincts. Those are too Democratic in mind. Keep yeah. them out. So <laughs> the, they'll, they'll be fighting. But at the end of the day, they do get to control uh, the process. Um, and th th that'll have effects for the next decade in Arkansas politics. Yeah. Bill, a bit earlier in the broadcast, you met, you used the phrase Trump Republican Party. This is the Trump Republican <clears throat> Party. Elaborate, please. Well, I think what you saw uh, over the last four years, especially on display nationally in the U.S. Senate, is more of a populist style Republican that cut from the kind of Reagan cloth. And, and that is, these are people that are concerned not necessarily about exporting jobs, but they're concerned about what happens in the Rust Belt. They're concerned about what happens in the South. Uh, a lot of these areas where people 
don't really care about climate change because they've got the rent to pay or a mortgage to pay or they want their kids' schools to be okay or their roads to work. And they're not rich enough to have real influence in Washington and they're not poor enough to take uh, advantage of the government's largesse. Those are the people that showed up in again, in record numbers for, for Trump this time. And I, I think when you consider the, the unprecedented uh, conflagration of all of these forces from pop culture to politics to media to the elites on the on the coast all pushing spending millions hundreds of millions of dollars if not a billion dollars plus on a get out the vote operation with the subtext being you got to throw the guy out of the out of office and then you see the fact that there was organically just these regular Americans showed up and went to the polls because they saw Trump as the only guy fighting for them they've heard a lot of rhetoric but he's the guy that finally stood up and fought for them I think that says a lot. It says a lot about where the Republican Party has moved to, away from exporting jobs to China, away from a 90s era Republican, and more now into, we're in a trade war with these guys. I think Tom Cotton probably exemplifies that sort of shift in Republican thinking, where you seem openly battling over foreign policy and making it uh, a necessity, and then focusing in on a number of things that are no longer perfunctory, but what are real meat and potatoes that affect people who are, are squarely in the middle class. So I, I, that's how I would define sort of what a Trump Republican is. One thing yeah, I would point out is that, you know, Arkansas Republicans, there are Trump Republicans, but let's don't forget that Trump was just rejected uh, across the country. He is on track, as we tape this today, to lose the presidential election, both in the popular vote and, but most importantly, in the electoral vote. Let me note for the audience, Michael, we're yes. taping at about noon on Friday. Exactly, so exactly. We don't know, but go ahead. Exactly. And, and, so, and so the, the trend lines are Donald Trump has been rejected by the American people. Uh, and now on the nationwide level, Republicans have to kind of figure out uh, you know, we flipped, looks like, as of, again, the taping at this exact moment, uh, Democrats look like they're flipping the state of Georgia, and it looks like they have flipped uh, the Republican state of Arizona. So uh, having, having defeated Trump on the national level, Republicans are going to have to come to terms of, you know, we thought we had this thing won, yeah. and, and then now uh, Trump, in, in 100 years, uh, only three presidents have been defeated for uh, prior to this election. Only three presidents have been defeated. So Democrats really pulled off a, a big uh, major win by by defeating Donald I, Trump pretty resoundingly this this election. I, Let me. I, I would just I'd like to jump in. I wouldn't go crazy about Georgia and Arizona because I think <laughs> you, you had a you, you had sort of the effort that I was talking about. And, and Steve, you brought upon the. The urban turnout effort that was there, I think, was, again, unprecedented, and you won't see it again in, in, in Georgia. And the two U.S. senators that are Republicans are both going to be reelected uh, in the state of Georgia. So I think Georgia is still squarely a Republican state. And in, in Arizona, I think what hurt the president there was, was his battle with the McCain family specifically. Uh, McCain's widow endorsing Joe Biden, campaigning with Joe Biden, making a, a, a number of stops, the daughter engaging in what she engaged in. Uh, so I think, um, uh, I, you know, we welcome uh, we welcome fights in Arizona and uh, and Georgia just because I think those are those will come back around in the next presidential. Well, don't, cycle. No, but don't forget though, in Arizona, in 2018, the Democrat defeated the Republican uh, for Senate, and in 2020, the Democrat defeated the Republican nominee for U.S. Senate that had nothing to do with John McCain and, and Donald Trump. So the trend line, just based on those two U.S. Senate seats, it's yeah. clearly heading in the wrong direction. Uh, and, then, and, uh, then, and then most importantly in Georgia, look, it's still gonna be a tough race, but if, if Democrats are able to hold on to and win it, that's a flip. That is a major a flip. Huge flip if that's that was. a major flip in a state that, you know, uh, Bill Clinton and, and Jimmy Carter were the only two Democrats in, in recent memory who've been able to win the, those two Southerners who've been quarter able to win it ago. in a quarter yeah. century. So if Democrats, uh, the, the the world in, in those those two uh, those two states is changing, which has a major effect on the yeah. electoral college for the, yeah. for the future. I, I, we would forward. we would we would love to see we would love to see the Democrats pour hundreds of millions of dollars into Arizona and Georgia in the next presidential cycle because they will uh, well, they, 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 they want it yeah. <laughs> they, yeah, they, they want two us they did and they 
will. It's a, <laughs> and win the presidency. And, 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 and in Georgia, now now it's going to be, now that the, the good news for Democrats is that because they, it looks like, the, again, we'll know at the, at the end, so on and so forth, they, if they flip the state of Georgia, and now there's going to be these two U.S. Senate seats that will determine the course of the, uh, who controls the U.S. Senate, and Democrats have, have been able to yeah, to, pick, mean, to, to, pick, to pick that lock, then, <laughs> then, it's, then, it's then it's just, you're, you're you know, that's going to be fighting. You're creating a narrative that is, that is not on the uh, horizon. I mean, so if these two Senate seats, and if Mars lines up with well, Venus. I mean, and, no, <laughs> no, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's a matter of fact. Joe Biden is on uh, track to win, the, to win the state of Georgia. I well, mean, let, 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 me, let, me, let me move it back to Arkansas, Bill, and sure. we'll start with you just a second. Uh, uh, and you talked about how the party has been pulled to the right by, during this Trump era. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hutch, Governor Hutchinson law, he's got a legislative session coming up. He yes. lost in the Senate a couple of gentlemen who were at a minimum willing to do business with him, and their yeah. successors appear to be rather to the right. What's, <laughs> what does this spell for Mr. Mr. Hutchinson? Well, I, I think maybe instead of worrying so much about um, uh, sort of the, 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 the thicker reddening of the Arkansas State Senate, this is the governor's last real legislative session. And so two-term governors have faced this phenomenon where they can't run for re-election anymore, and they're looking at uh, a government that you've got people in the Senate running for higher office, you've got people in the House who want to run for Senate seats. We've got some folks who are term-limited out. They're going to have to be moving on at a certain point in time. So there is always, at this point in time, there is always some uh, a high level of difficulty for a sitting governor to get an agenda passed simply because... Uh, he's on the way out the door, and that's a that's a uh, timing reality. Uh, I do think you're right. I think things like uh, reauthorizing uh, Arkansas Works and making it more conservative, I think, is on the horizon. But and then can can I say this too, Steve? I think the actual execution of the legislative session is going to be very difficult because you're going to have close restrictions to, uh, to access in the Capitol. You're going to have uh, committee hearings at night, some in the morning scheduled general sessions where you have these huge partitions up. You can see them now in the state Senate. So the actual execution of how the laws are being made, nobody's led into committee hearings, being live streamed, and you have to text in or email in questions and things of that nature. All of that is yet another uh, layer on top of all of this. Um, but the governor's pretty resourceful. Uh, he knows how to get things done. So uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't bet against Asa Hutchinson not getting a, a bunch of his priorities in this session. Yeah, Michael, go ahead. I, I would defer to, to, to Bill on the internal dynamics of Republican politics in the state Senate. He'll, he'll know that better than I do. I, I would echo the fact that Asa is now a lame duck uh, governor, and so he does lose leverage, and the Senate seems to be pushing back. You know, he's kind of gotten whatever his way the whole time uh, during his governorship. But yeah, with the even recent, before with, the primaries. Even before even the before, primaries. But yeah. with, the, with the recent election of the new Senate pro tem, I think the yeah. Senate is asserting their dominance and that their priorities. Uh, and now I think you're going to have some in, internal struggles among the two. Democrats, of course, unfortunately, are in the minority, uh, a, a significant minority. What has happened in the past is that behind the scenes, the Republicans would go to Democrats and say, look, this is a crazy bill. Can you help us kill it? Can you, you know, help us get rid of it? Yeah. And now there's few of them, of them around to do that. Uh, and, and also the ones that are there, they saw what happened to the incumbents they ran, uh, who ran this time. They voted for the bill, like the, the, the 911 <clears throat> fee increase that every, all, every Republican supported from the governor on down, but then Republicans used that against them uh, when they ran for re-election. So, so for the few Democrats that are there, they're going to be like, you guys, you folks figured out yourselves, but uh, I think we are going to see some uh, battles that we've seen in the past among the Democrats when you've had laid up governors. Now it'll just be among Republicans. Looking forward to 20, uh, 20, 2022, mm -hmm. 2022. Uh, any glimmers, Michael, that you see for, your, for, for the Democrats? Too early to tell. I mean, uh, the, right now the action is on the Republican primary. We know two candidates, uh, Leslie Rutledge, uh, the attorney general, and Tim Griffin, the lieutenant governor, are going to be fighting it out. Uh, Sarah Sanders, the uh, former press secretary for Trump, may jump in. That's the, that's the great unknown. Uh, B uh, Bill is right. They're going to be fighting it How out. How great is the great right. unknown? I mean, it's yeah, e e exactly. Uh, Democrats 
you know, don't know, uh, you know, we had a great candidate in uh, in 2018, um, real credible, ran a great race, of course, did not did not win. So I think that's the Democrats' best bet is to find uh, a good candidate, run a strong race, and know it's still going to be a tough fight. But again, you, you just have to keep fighting till the end. Yeah. Uh, Bill, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, to quote a popular TV show for Democrats, winter is coming. <laughs> <laughs> and it's going to be brutal uh, in 22, 24, and 26. Well, you've got what could be a rather brutal Republican gubernatorial primary coming mm -hmm. up. Truly, you know? truly, you're exactly correct. You're, yeah. I mean, with uh, let's assume then that Sarah Sanders gets in. You've got uh, the Republican lieutenant governor, Tim Griffin, who has raised an, an enormous amount of money uh, already in advance. I mean, we just finished Election Day 2020, and he's got a million two in the bank for uh, the primary in 2022. Uh, Leslie Rutledge, uh, also as the attorney general, wildly popular. Uh, uh, and then, of course, you throw in Sarah Sanders, who represented Trump, who is the embodiment of the Trump administration, come to Arkansas with a history here. So um, we'll have a nice little family fight. Sarah Sanders, I think, becomes the front runner if she jumps in because she Trump has her back, regardless of whether he's in the White House or not. He's still popular among Arkansas Republicans. I think she would be formidable to beat if she decides to jump in that Republican primary. Yeah, a few seconds remaining. Bill, you go along with that, Ms. Sanders, as the front runner? There'll be 300, 320,000 people vote in the Republican primary in 2022. That's a big turnout number, but uh, not so big that um, uh, that you can't win it with just real hard work and old fashioned campaigning. So that that's uh, uh, that's what I think Republicans are pointing to. Guys, we got to end it there because we're simply out of time. Bill Vickery, Michael Cook, Thank as you. always, thanks to you guys Thank for coming in. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. See you next week. Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR-FM 89.